happened. It's fucking happened. Oh my god. Speechless, guys. Here we go, guys. Welcome to the first instalment of hopefully many carping in Australia vlogs. Um, bit of an introduction what, what I wanted to do was sort of wind the clock back a few years and and sort of find myself back in the northwest of England um, booking my flight to Australia for the following week um, with absolutely no plan no idea what I was gonna do um, and fishing was definitely the last thing on my mind at that point in time um, so on Skyscanner, booking a flight to, to Sydney, Australia for the following Tuesday. Um, in a bit of a panic mode, realising that I had all these different belongings, all this fishing gear that I needed to get rid of because I wasn't sure whether I was coming to Australia for two weeks, two months, two years. There, there was just no plan. Um, so with carp fishing being the last thing on my mind and absolutely no um, understanding that there was carp here in Australia to be caught. Um, I went through a, a bit of a panic trying to sell all of my fishing kit. Um, long story short, I sold it to the first person that offered me some money and to say that I got ripped off is an absolute understatement. Uh, if you, the guy that bought my stuff ever sees this vlog, I hope you're enjoying using my kit because you got it for basically nothing. Um, but yeah, it was one of them. I was in a, a mass panic, no time to spare, just needed to get rid of my equipment, make all of the money that I could um, to get across here to Australia and hopefully survive as long as possible. Um, following Tuesday came, I was sat there in Manchester airport, shaking like a leaf, um, ended up drinking one or two bottles of wine to try and calm myself down because at that point in time I was I was relatively young I, I'd never done anything like that um, and to be flying to pretty much the furthest place away from England that there is on earth um, on your own with no sort of plan or security it, it's quite a daunting prospect so the the couple of, bottle of bottles of wine that I, I sunk on the plane definitely calmed the nerves um, anyway, thir 36 hours or so later, landed in Australia, um, and as you can imagine, again, being in a new country, carp fishing again wasn't anything that I'd been thinking about. Um, as you'd expect, landing in a country like Australia, the first thing that you wanted to do was go out partying, um, do all of the touristy stuff, hit the beaches, do all of the usual touristy stuff. Um, now, all because we're in Australia, that, that touristy stuff doesn't last a week or a month. You feel like you're permanent, permanently on holiday. Um, so the, there's a lot of things to keep you distracted and, and sort of steer you away from even thinking about carp fishing. Um, ended up finding a job, doing a few different bits and pieces. Um, and, and you could say living the dream for two or three years in a country that absolutely blown it's absolutely blown my mind the, the the way of living over here absolutely everything is completely different um so yeah for, for two or three years carp fishing never never entered my mind um of course I, i'd i'd still keep up to date with what was going on back in the uk um a lot of my friends still catching big fish a lot of people on my instagram and that still catching big fish um but as the the sort of years went by it slowly but surely became something that I missed. Um, and the, the challenging part was I couldn't have a piece of it. Um, and I was certainly never in any position to book a flight home for the sake of carp fishing. It, it just wasn't something that was on the agenda. Um, so yeah, two, three, maybe four years passed um, before I realized that there was actually carp in Australia. Um, one night I, I was actually um, at home with my partner on a Friday evening um, and we were planning a, a trip to a local park in Sydney. Um, I hadn't actually been there at the time so we decided to have a little bit of a, a look on the website. Um, scrolling through the website, um, just flicking along uh, and, and would you believe it, there's a, a picture of a, an Australian gentleman holding up this big common carp and my jaw hit the floor. I was like, I'm in Sydney, I'm in Australia, and there's a, a 30, mid 30 pound common being hoisted up 
like a, an like a, a noddy held like this this massive common being held up and i'm thinking wow there's carp here M my mind was absolutely blown and, and i turned around to my partner i don't think she'd seen me see it at the time but i turned around and i said yeah i think we should probably go and check that park out tomorrow so we we packed all of the equipment we packed all the drinks picnic basket or all the usual stuff um got down there the next day and, and there's probably five or six lakes on this particular this particular parklands um it it turns out there's no fishing anyway so i was a little bit disappointed but to still be able to go around using watercraft again for the first time in however many years and visibly seeing carp in front of me that was enough to fill the gap that there'd been for the last two or three years it was it, it was like the fire was being lit again and all i'd seen is a couple of pasties like it was it's crazy um and it's safe to say matt and my missus got pretty uh pretty short tempered with me that day because we did plan to go down and and obviously look around and um chill out enjoy the sun and i spent probably three quarters of the day running around the different lakes dragging her around looking at carp and she <laughs> She hated it and I, I, at the time she knew I was passionate about carp, she, she really knew I was passionate about carp, um, but I, I can remember thinking to myself, little does she know what she's in store for over the coming months and, and future, I thought she's going to see the real me now, um, but what I ended up doing, I um, if I remember, because at that point in time I didn't have any, any carp fishing equipment, in fact I barely had any sea fishing equipment at the time, um, I remember getting home that night and just thinking, where do I start? Like, I I'm sat in the middle of Sydney. I don't know anybody that carp fishes. I don't know any carp anglers. There's little to no information online whatsoever around carp or where they could be. Um, I, I just didn't know where to start. I, I was absolutely lost, but it was a really, really good feeling of being lost. Um, Back in the UK, you only have to jump online and you can see how many fish are in certain lakes, how many big fish are in certain lakes, how many 30 pounders, how many 50 pounders. Um, and you straight away, you know you can put yourself in with a good opportunity. Um, in, in the UK, fishing for unknown fish is very, very hard to come by. Obviously it's possible, but very, very hard to come by. And certainly something that I was never actually used to in the UK during the time that I fished back there. Um, so I was lost, I, I was definitely out of my comfort zone, but I was absolutely buzzing to get going. Um, so that night I, I jumped onto Google Maps and basically zoomed in on pretty much every single body of water that I could find in Sydney. Um, I, I was online ordering a few different bits of kit from uh, a few sea fishing websites, scrambling together to try and, and see, what, see what I could put together to actually go out and target fish. Now, when you've got no carp fishing gear, you come to realize how much you take things for granted. Baiting needles, just the obvious things that are so, so unthought of that are extremely, extremely important to getting about in day-to-day -day carp fishing. Um, so what I basically did is I, I got a bit of sea fishing kit, a um, few tins of sweet corn and, and just went on my way. I, I went to a few different places around Sydney, um, didn't catch any fish, but it just felt incredible to be out on the road searching carp. Now, over the next two to three months, I was lucky to, to sort of become friends with a couple of other lads that are from the UK um, who were sort of semi into carp fishing, slightly into carp fishing at the time. Um, and that sort of opened a bit of a, a door really because when you sort of go into all of these sort of unknown venues, the, these different places where you're not too sure whether there's carp or not, it's really, really good to have another pair of eyes with you. Um, and again, when you're with another person, I'm sure we can all agree that the passion builds, the fire builds, and, and it's extremely motivating to get up and get out there. Um, so over the next two, three, four months, um, I fished uh, a few different venues, a few of the different river systems in Sydney. Um, I travelled up to the likes of the Australian Capital Territory, um, catching fish, a lot of carp, a lot of fish. 
um, mainly your sort of 10, 15, 20, 25 pounders um, from venues that were very, very well stocked in carp. Now that, that, that really did keep me going for a good while. Like I was enjoying my fishing, I was getting back into the groove and I was catching fish in a country that I now call home. So to actually be experiencing that again was, was absolutely incredible. But catching 10, 15, 20 pounders can only get you so far before you start really wanting to get among something a little bit more special. And at that point in time, I'd slowly but surely been getting gear sent over from the UK. Um, I had some Nash scopes ordered. I had my de some Delkin sent over. Um, I had a few different bits and pieces sent over. And before I knew it, I had what was relatively similar to the the kit that I had back home. Um, now, throughout these few months, I was actually quite lucky to to uh, speak, be put in contact with a gentleman that goes by the name of of Don Don Priestley. Um, and Don Priestley is actually a, an English bloke who's been in Australia for quite a lot longer than I have. Um, and he runs his own sort of online tackle shop over here for the very few amount of carp anglers that are in it are over here. Um, and again, big shout out to Don because with his, his, his way of getting things into Australia when it comes to, to carp fishing, without Don, we would be screwed. You know, we, we would be screwed. Um, so for, for Don to be putting the small amount of carp anglers in the pocket over here um, he really does I guess have some sort of involvement with everybody's captures over here so big shout out to Don. Now at this point in time I, I was really looking for something to settle into I mean of course I like I like dotting around fishing all these different wonderful venues incredible scenery um, some of these river systems, some of these lakes go to over 10, 11, 15,000 acres in size. So dotting around fishing all these different venues, of course, was good fun. Um, but I really, really missed that campaign style of fishing. Um, the trouble was with no information, I didn't really know where I could campaign or, or if there was anything at that point in time worth campaigning for. Um, so as luck would have it, I ended up one night I was on I was on Google Maps and I thought I need to find something that's separate to all of the the busy stuff. Something that's something that's lower stocked, something that's clearer in terms of water quality, abundance of natural food, obviously much, much lower stock, um, and, and just an environment where carp could potentially grow a little bit bigger. Um, so yeah, one night on Google Maps, I, I ended up finding a place that looked to me at the time like it ticked all the boxes. Um, I didn't know that there was carp in there at the time. I had no idea that it held carp. Um, but yeah, I, I went down first trip and just from looking at the lake, I thought if there's nice looking carp in Australia within touching point of me, this is probably going to be the place. And and I can remember doing my first few laps and um, didn't see any carp or anything like that. But um, just from looking at the, the water quality, the ecosystem in there, I thought if there's carp, they're probably going to be pretty decent size. Um, and there's obviously not many of them. So it was something that I, I really, really was, was drawn to at the time. Um, the problem was at the time, I didn't have any way of getting the types of bait that I wanted, the likes of your hemp, your tiger nuts, um, all that type of stuff at the time, um, due to not having the information that I've got now, was very, very difficult to get a hold of. So I ended up baiting with sacks of maize. Um, now, baiting up in bulk with maize is not my I ideal way of, of, of fishing, um, but it was all that I had at the time. So I, I chose this particular spot um, and it was a part of the, the venue that was on like a corner. And what that meant was, is that it always got the wind. If there was ever wind, this is where the wind had a bit of an impact. Um, so I found this little spot in the margin. It was a silty spot, only a foot and a half deep. Um, and I thought that's, that's as good a place as any. The whole, the whole place was pretty shallow to be fair. So a foot and a half, two foot deep in the edge there, it was probably a similar depth out in the middle anyway. So it, it really made no difference. Um, so yeah, started in introducing this maze. Um, and then 
a few days later came the moment that really, really did open my eyes. Um, I'd been down a few times, not seen any fish. I was stood there, probably 15, 20 foot back from, from my spot. Um, I'd already done maybe 20, 30 minutes um, of sort of lapping, looking round and hadn't seen anything. And I was on the phone to my friend at the time. And I can remember being stood just back from the spot and seeing this, this common come from the weeds in the gin clear water, only a few inches under the surface, kited left ever so slowly and went down on this maze. Now it only ate maybe two mouthfuls of maize before it slowly sort of left the spot. And I can remember going into meltdown. It wasn't a monster, so don't, don't, please don't think I'm talking about a 50 pounder. But to me at the time, it was like a 50 pounder. It, it was probably a, a mid 20 wood carving of a common, something that was like out of an old estate lake back in England. And I thought, I've just seen this in Australia, just in front of my eyes completely different to all of the carp that i've seen so far I, I was absolutely amazed um and now this particular this particular um instance this carp came in it, it had the bit of maze and then it disappeared i'm on the phone to my mate going mental um and then five ten minutes went by i've obviously got off the phone to my friend and this commons come back in and it's come back in at another two or three mouthfuls of maize and then two others have come in and join it. Now, the two others were only small fish, maybe 10 or 15 pound in size. But I can remember thinking to myself, it never happened, but I can remember thinking this at the time, that common's just gone off and told its mates that it's found its first ever free meal in Australia. Come on, boys, come and get a bit of this. Because it was just funny the way it came in, at the maze, disappeared and came back with its mates. And I thought, that carp's never at maize before in its life. That, that carp's probably never had a meal like that in its life. And uh, the first thing it's done is scurried off to its mates, told them about this free meal and then come back in. Um, but yeah, that was the, the first sighting of a good carp uh, in Australia, a good looking carp at least anyway. Um, and then that enabled me to really, really get my teeth stuck into something. Um, now, over the, over the following few months, I began to find out how many different things can go against you when it comes to Australian fishing. Um, you've got eels. Now, these eels are not like English eels that go up to six, seven, eight, nine pound. These are eels that go up to 15, 20 pound in size. That They're absolutely massive. And they're not something you wanna be dealing with on the bank at two o'clock in the morning. Um, on top of that, you've got turtles. Now. The turtles are an absolute nightmare. Um, they'll pick up anything, they'll destroy anything. Um, they'll move your rigs. If you're not using big leads, they'll move your rigs. They cause all sorts of stuff. Um, I know bream in the UK are bad, and to be fair, they're probably worse than turtles, but trust me, trust me, guys, if you're, if you're getting beeps and takes off turtles that are moving your rigs off the spot, it is still not good fun. So it's not all, uh, it's not all uh, sunshine and roses over here in Australia. Um, on top of that, you're worrying about the things that are, are in the water. You know, you're worrying about these turtles, you're worrying about these eels. The bird life, as you'd expect, is very similar to back home. They can cause you all sorts of trouble. But the thing that you're, you're conscious of the most is, is what's not what's in the water. It's, it's what's on the bank. Um, I'm sure anybody that knows much about Australia, the old saying goes, anything on Australia wants to kill you. Um, now, it's not as bad as that, I'll be honest, guys. I've been here for seven years and I'm, I'm still alive. You can still, um, you can see I'm still very much alive. Um, but yeah, it is true. There are a lot of things on the bank that you need to be very, very wary of. Um, you've got things like white tip spiders, red back spiders, funnel web spiders, um, just to name a few. Um, but then you've also got brown snakes, red belly black snakes, some of the most venomous animals in the world, creatures in the world, quite literally walking around right in front of you. So you do have to be on your toes. Um, there was an instance once where I did actually get bit by a red back spider. Um, and this was on a baiting session. I had to go to the hospital and they did the thing with the, the anti-venom and the steroids and it made me pretty sick. So it does happen, but 
when you get stuck into something it kind of it kind of separates from you you kind of sort of become a little bit oblivious to it because you're that obsessed with fishing for carp but no it in all seriousness you do have to be on your toes a little bit um but yeah obviously getting stuck in without a care in the world happy to be mingling with all these spiders and snakes as long as i could get the opportunity to fish for carp so yeah over the following the following couple of years or so i spent a lot of time fishing um on this particular place um ended up luckily getting hold of things like hemp tiger nuts um i went through a phase of hiding bivvies down there hiding boats down there dropping rigs at night or all sorts of different things and and catching some incredible fish um some really really dark commons just something completely different to the usual australian carp and that's what made it so special um but yeah over the over the time that i fished it i began to sort of get a few recaptures and start feeling that my time was coming into coming to an end on there um there is there is a couple or so that still get under my, under my skin that i've not caught yet um but due to a few different reasons i think they're probably going to be gone i don't think i'm going to get the opportunity to to go on that particular place due to a few different things that have happened and um, that make it very 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 difficult to fish now um so i think all the memories memories are stored up in here i don't think i'm going to get the opportunity to go back um but i guess it's not a bad thing it, things don't last forever as they say so yeah obviously at that point in time i was uh, a little bit stuck between a rock and a hard place um we've got three months left of, of good fishing time uh, the fish are spawning in three months i've just been kicked off my old place um and after three year three or, or so years of looking um i knew it was pretty unlikely that i was going to find anything similar to what i'd been lucky enough to experience in uh, over that 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 sort of course of time um, so yeah, back to square one. Um, one thing I'd always known is that big carp did exist in Australia. Um, to put things into perspective, known big carp, uh, obviously pe some people keep things quiet, but in the whole state of New South Wales, which is a very, very big place, I only know of definitely less than a handful of legitimate 40 pound carp caught ever in the history of, of carp fish the small history that is of carp fishing over here in australia still a handful of legitimate 40 pounders so that was one thing that was always on the back of my mind i wanted a big carp i knew that there wasn't much history in terms of big carp over here they had been caught um but they were very 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 rare um that's not me saying that there's not many of them of, over here that's me saying that there's just not a lot of people fishing for them. They are there, they are there to be caught. They do take a lot of effort, um, but it, it's just, they're a rarity. Um, so one thing I wanted to do was sort of put myself in a position over the course of the next three months uh, of having a shot at potentially catching a, a big common. Um, so the, the sort of difficult point that I was at there is that I knew a few different places that could potentially hold big commons um, but with having such a short amount of time left at my disposal um, it, it was a bit rushed in a sense that I had to jump on Google Maps, go back to square one, find somewhere that was a bit out of the way um, and hopefully ride a little bit of luck, get a little bit lucky because in a lot of these rivers you don't really see carp, you, you rarely see fish bosh you rarely see carp feeding in the edges. Um, a lot of it is down to, to baiting in mass and, and just fishing regularly. Um, so yeah, Google Maps found this, this particular spot. Um, was down there on my third or fourth trip. Um, I saw a carp, a carp on this particular area. My first carp on probably the third or fourth trip. Um, I saw probably three or four black snakes in the swim before I saw a carp um, you, as you can see on the, the screen guys they're not small either so that was a, a bit of a difficult one to get around um, but after seeing my first carp show in that particular spot I, I knew that that was where I wanted to be um, 
as I said, it's very, very rare that you see carp show here, um, it, particularly in the rivers. So to see one, that, that was more than good enough for me. Um, I, I had had about 50 kilo of particle prepped in my the back of my ute um, that was due to go into the, the other venue that had just been, been sort of uh, fishing. Um, and the plan was wherever I see a spot that looks good, that's where I'm gonna put this particle. Um, now, the, the thing that sort of kept me really out of my comfort zone is the fact that on some of these tidal rivers, the flow can be, can be quite savage. You've got flow that's going through, you're fishing four, five, six ounce leads, baiting up with particle and things like that can be quite challenging. So a bit of, a bit of knowledge from barbel fishing back home, watching a few of the guys in Europe fishing some of these big canals and big river systems really, really came in handy. Um, and preparation phase was well and truly on. Um, all I knew is that I was gonna hit it hard. I, I actually had, I knew that I had uh, a couple, a week or so of leave coming up. Um, and that was due to coincide with the, the full moon um, that I'd actually caught the, the, the big carp out of the previous place on, bang on one of the full moons. Um, I had originally booked it off to go back onto that venue. Um, but yeah, it, as luck would have it, I did have a week at my disposal coming up soon and I knew that that was going to be the time that I was going to put in the most effort. Um, so to begin with, I was making the trip down. I was putting in, I put in 50 kilo of particle on that first trip, that first baiting spell. Um, and then most evenings I was driving down and putting in to begin with probably 10 kilo of bait. This is for the first week or so. 10 kilo of bait pretty much every night with the, the plan that I was going to come down and fish it the following week. Yeah, so the, as I said, the plan was I was going to come down and fish it that following week for the first time. Um, I'd been coming down each night in the dark, putting in 10 kilo of bait, going to work obviously the next day. Um, and the, the excitement was building. I still hadn't seen any good fish. Um, I had seen that one fish show on my spot. Um, but just knowing that I'd been consistent, I'd been going down baiting every single night, I, I was excited to get down there. Um, so longest week of my life. I got down there originally on a, I got down there on the Sunday. Um, I had plans on the Saturday, so I knew that I couldn't fish on the Saturday. Got down on the Sunday, scorching hot heat, worst fishing conditions you can imagine. Um, but I was just keen to get a couple of rods in on the baited spot. Um, now on that first trip, I managed one fish. It was a mid double ghosty. Um, so only a small fish, really, really nice fish though. And to get off the mark um, was the most important thing. My, my first fish on a new venue, uh, fishing relatively different style to what I'd been used to. Big leads, big, big sort of, big sort of heavy equipment, um, and fishing in conditions that I wasn't used to. Um, so it was really, really good to get off the mark. Um, one thing that I really had to adapt to was reading the tides. Now, on these tidals, the conditions are changing constantly. So as an example, when the tide's going in, the tide's going out, the current's going one way, the current's going the other, which meant that when I actually came down to put bait in, I, I never really got the opportunity to throw the bait over my spot. I had to read the tide and then judge how many 10, 15, 20 yards upstream or 10, 20 yards downstream, I should be throwing all of my particle before it hits the bottom. So that was one thing that I had to watch. Um, as well as that, what I had to look for was the gaps in which the tide would stop. So ideally, if there was an evening where the tide was completely still, like at a peak at the, the top or at the bottom, a slack tide, if that coincided with an evening, that would be a night that I'd put in triple the amount of bait, um, just purely because I knew I could throw it accurately straight over the spot and all of the particle would sink down to where I was actually going to be fishing. So on those nights, I'd be putting in 20, 30 kilo of particle. Um, one thing I also did to try and, and this was more so over the next few days as I got into the swing of things, um, I, I learned to separate all of my bait. I'd have hemp in one bucket, I'd have my chickpeas or my maples in another, I'd have my tigers in another. And, and what that enabled me to do was actually throw the particle in at different points up and down the bank. 
So things like tigers and chickpeas, they sink relatively quickly. So I knew that I could throw that relatively close to my baited zone, but then with the hemp and the pigeon mix and all these different other items, I'd be having to go much further downstream, baiting up there so that the bait was brought back into my zone. So that, that, that was a big thing that I sort of, I sort of implemented that definitely increased the, the chances of me catching fish. Um, now, over the course of the first few trips, um, the first weekend, the second weekend, I started catching a few nice fish. None of the real whackers, um, but I started getting into fish that were, were certainly well into the 20 pound bracket. Um, I was also noticing when the bite times were coming in. So as the tides were stopped and they were slack, I would never get a bite nothing would happen you'd think that when the tide's still um, and you're able to bait more accurately that should increase your chances of a bite but over the the sort of course of the trips i came to realize that that was the best time to bait but not the best time to get a bite it was actually one of the most quieter spells of the the day and the night um, the times in which the fish the fish traffic was predominantly coming was in the middle when the flow was at its absolute fastest um, so that made the baiting difficult but the fishing became good um, fishing three rods relatively close in down the edge using five at five six ounce gripper leads um, PVA bags of tiger nuts and um, fishing just at the bottom of the slope down the margin um, started to put a few fish together you know 15 20 low 20 pounders catching fish quite consistently um, I was also noticing patterns in which which rods would go first if the flow was coming this way that rod would go first if the flow was coming that way that rod would do most of the bites um, which was could have been a coincidence or the fish are traveling against the current and then they're picking up that rig first or getting amongst those rigs first so maybe it was a coincidence but that was that was becoming a bit of a pattern um, another thing that i noticed as well is that there were definitely certain bite times um, at this point a week or so later i'd probably done a couple of evenings a couple of night sessions um, and i noticed that that nights were relatively unproductive i wasn't catching many fish during the night um, the best spell by far was between six o'clock in the morning and probably about 8 30 in the morning now as the swim started to build i was catching fish i caught some nice carp a, a big or a little orange fish that was quite cool looking as well um as you can see from the the screen that this this fish is definitely not wearing its right right choice of camouflage and the reason that i say it's not wearing a good choice of camouflage is not just because it's orange um but because in this this particular tidal um and you guys back home probably won't be used to hearing this but it's actually got big sharks in it so i'm not talking five six foot sharks i'm talking 10 11 12 13 foot long bull sharks um, these are the fish that are responsible for a lot of the, the attacks that you guys probably see on the news back in the uk from australia um, these are the fish that are going around and again it's very very rare but these are the fish that are making the headlines so they're swimming in the exact same venue that i've been fishing um, and then you've got this big orange thing somehow getting about living its living its life without getting hit by a shark um, so that was always uh, that was always something that made me laugh um, in terms of what else was swimming around in the, the the river i was catching quite a few sea fish I, I was catching sea fish whilst fishing tigers the bobbins would be going up and down with sea fish all the time i knew that they were probably getting a lot of the the bait that i was putting in hence the reason behind absolutely piling it in um it got to the point after the first week or two that i was actually going down every single night and putting in bare minimum 25 to 30 kilo of pigeon mix and um, the good thing about pigeon mix is, is, is it, it's extremely cheap it's really really cost effective and um, so that enabled me to go through tons and tons of bait without being too concerned about the pocket and um, the thing that really was damaging my pocket was the toll roads in sydney um, wherever you, you can get in your car and drive anywhere in sydney and you're probably getting told for it um, so the bills for the tolls were racking up 
the, the bills for the particle were racking up, but I just knew that I had, at that point in time, a month or two left um, of good fishing, so I was gonna go hard at it. Um, so yeah, over the course of the first few trips, first couple of weeks, I was putting quite a few good fish together um, and it got to probably the second or third week before I, ha I had my first good fish. Um, I'd, I'd been down, um, got down at probably 6.30 in the morning, um, underarm the rigs out, ready for, for the morning bite time. Um, and straight away I was away. Um, right hander, peeling off, picked up the rod. I've got it like this and it's surging across the tide. It's going with the tide. And before I know it, it's, it's running along the far margin. It's, it's absolutely taking me off down the river. And, and I just knew from the fights that I'd been having from the smaller fish, that this was gonna be something that was a little bit more special. Um, anyway, I'm fighting it up and down the current, up and down the current. Before, before you know it, I've got it under my rod tip and it's just hugging the bottom at the bottom of this shelf. Um, I'm fishing in anything between eight and 12 foot of depth, depending on which level the tide's at. And this fish is just hugging the bottom, fighting similar to what uh, a big fat mirror would be doing back in the UK, just slow plodding. Anyway, I've been fighting it for five, 10 minutes. It's come up and I can clearly see that it's a lot better than a lot of the fish that I've been catching. Um, without any shadow of a doubt, I knew it was a 30 pounder, big, long, golden common. It's gone kiting down the right hand margin and I, down the right hand margin, it's, it's littered with like overhanging trees and snags. And amongst these snags, there's like a pool of water, like a, a pool and the fish, by chance had gone round these particular snags and was now sort of in this pool where there was no snags. But I knew that the fish was never gonna come out and come back round to my side. I had to go down there and get it. So I, I, I sort of followed it down the margin, got past all of these snags and then I was playing it in this pool and I could see it surging down, burrowing down under all these snags. I'm, I'm cringing as the break, the, the bra they've got the braid, I've got the five ounce lead on, and I'm thinking I'm gonna lose this fish. There's no way I'm gonna get it in. Uh, and what made it worse is that I looked 15 yards down the bank and my net's just sat there. And I thought, you're absolutely kidding me. Um, if I put the rod down now, I'm not gonna land it. If I, if I free spool it, it's gonna go into the snags. What am I gonna do? Now, I was stood in probably two foot of water and I thought the only thing I can do really here is, is hand land the fish. So I'm playing this common, I've got it into a foot or two of water and I've got it, I've got it like this. I've picked this carp up out the water, I'm carrying it like this. Um, I've got it in my hands and I'm thinking, how am I gonna get it back to my spot? Um, so I ended, up, I ended up actually unhooking this fish in the water um, risking it swimming off and losing it. I've got it across my hands like this and I sort of shuffled along on my knees in the water all the way back to my spot with this common and then put it, got it in the net, put it into the, the net. Probably the luckiest capture I've ever had, but to get a good one and to get it in that fashion, I, I, was, I was stoked. I, I was so, so happy to finally get amongst a better fish. Um, now, the problem was I, I had never really carried scales. Now, I know that sounds daft, every person should be carrying scales around when they're fishing, but it was never about that for me. When I've been fishing in Australia, it's all been about catching carp, catching special fish. The weight's never really been something that had concerned me. Um, it, on previous captures, I'd had a friend with me, my friends have carried scales, they've weighed the fish and, and that's how I've sort of recorded them. But still up, at this, up until this point, I never had a set of scales myself. Uh, and this was the first time where I thought, crikey, this is a pretty good fish. I could do with having some scales now. Um, so as luck would have it, one of my friends, he's not really an angler, not really a carp angler. Uh, I knew he was off work. Um, so I gave him a call. I said, mate, I've got this, this pretty good common in the net. Um, do you fancy driving down and, uh, and doing a few photos for me? Um, so he came down, he brought these, these scales down with him, um, got the fish up really really clean fish golden common exactly what i wanted when i set out fishing the the river um and the fish went 32 pound so 
absolutely stoked to have finally got myself a really, really decent fish um, and from a river as vast as, as the one that I was fishing. So yeah, obviously I was over the moon to have, have finally got amongst uh, a much better fish. Um, saw out the rest of that day with, with sort of no more action. Um, and then I was back into work. Um, the last thing I wanted at that point in time was to be back into work after catching uh, a few really, really nice fish, including that, that awesome 30 pounder. Um, but the good thing was that I knew I had this week coming. Th this full week of fishing was coming. Um, and I, I was at full throttle at this point in time. I, I sort of reflect back on that time I had on the previous lake where I was going through the phase of, of going down every night, boating rigs out, fishing work nights. This was the first time that I'd found something else that had really put me into this mode. So yeah, I was, I was in full throttle. I, I was excited to get back down. Um, I knew that that following weekend I was going to come down and do at least a couple of days fishing. So that week, same process, every single night I was coming down, putting 25 kilo of pigeon mix in, putting in probably half a kilo of tigers a night. Now, you guys might be critical saying, oh, you're a bit of a tight ass putting only half a kilo of tigers in. Um, but for you guys back home, if you were in Australia, you'd realize that tiger nuts are very, very difficult to get a hold of. It's like, it's like gold dust. People go crazy for getting a hold of a kilo of tigers over here. Um, the reason being, they're very, very difficult to import. There's next to no suppliers. Um, and in some insta instances, you're paying over 20 kilo, $20 a kilo for tiger nuts. So the last thing you wanna be doing is throwing in tons of them when you know that you could be out before you know it. So yeah, um, I was putting in about half a, half a kilo maybe even not half, maybe a quarter of a kilo of tigers each night, because I knew that there was a lot of sea fish, they, they, they wouldn't really focus on the tiger nuts so much, so I wanted to just stick to going in mass with the particle. Um, so yeah, that week I was down every night, reading the tides, 25 kilo of pigeon mix every single night, knowing that I had a couple of days fishing the following week. Um, I can remember on the Friday night, packing all my stuff, getting all of the car ready, buzzing to get down here knowing that I wanted to get down here for about 3.30 in the morning. Um, bite time was coming, 6 o'clock, 6.30. I knew that if I could get my rods in position, I was in with a very, very good chance. Um, so yeah, morning came, got down here, got down here at about 4 o'clock, 4.30, rods in position, bobbins start going up and down with the sea fish. Um, but I just knew that as as the, the sort of sun started to, to emerge, dawn, that, that it wouldn't be long based on previous sessions um, for me to, to hopefully get amongst a fish. Um, 7, 7.30, light clockwork, both of the rods, both two of the rods were away. The middle, the middle and the right hander were, were away within probably a two minute spell of each other first fish I managed to get in the net the other rods churning luckily I could see that it wasn't heading towards the snags down the right hand margin this fish was just peeling off upstream and I'm bent into another fish on the other rod um, the, the the fish that was on the rod that I was playing ended up being a carp of about 10 pounds so I got that one in the net unhooked it really really quickly um, and then picked up into the other fish now by the time I picked up into this fish it had gone probably a hundred yards but about a hundred yards upstream it was absolutely peeling off i'm bent into this fish again the rod's taking on all of the pressure it's surging off upstream with the upstream with what was the current on that particular tide and it's absolutely busting it getting down the left hand margin the the one thing that i knew about the left hand margin is that there's a lot of snags coming over the water um but they don't they don't really go into the water. So I was a little bit less concerned that the fish was gonna take me under the snags. I could afford to sort of put a lot of pressure on, but knew that I wasn't in too much danger. So yeah, it's cranking it down the margin, cranking it, cranking it. Before I know it, again, it's under the rod tip. It's up on the surface. Um, and I can see again that it's a nice 20 odd pound common, mid, mid 20 plus common. Bundled this fish into the net, um, got this fish up on the bank, 
got some self takes and um, got a bit of video footage of it um, and realized at that point in time that I needed to get the rod back out quickly so yeah obviously being in the the thick of the thick of bite time and catching those two fish in really really quick succession I knew that I had to get my rods back out really really quickly um, at that moment I still had one rod left in the water um, fishing still quite close to each other there was probably a five foot gap in between the three rods so I knew that there was a good shoal of fish still on me um, and I knew that there was still a chance of a bite it was still prime bite time and I knew that I could be on for a little bit of a hit so had that small common had that better common put it back before I'd even sat back down, the rod that I'd just repositioned it was away. It, it, it must have been out for no more than maybe two minutes. I, I'd underarmed this PVA bag straight over the top of the, the area. Obviously, there was still food down there and it was away again. Um, again, bent into this fish, took on a big curve, screaming off down the river. Um, screaming off up the river sorry using all of the current to its advantage and again I, I knew that I was into a pretty decent fish um, so same process again the fish takes me to the far bank rods taking on the full pressure surging up and down using the current like these big commons in the, the tidals do swings down the left hand margin and again I've got another sort of under the tip job on my, my hands again um, this fish fought considerably harder I can remember I went through probably a two or three minute phase of it just going up and down the margin I hadn't seen it and I can remember thinking to myself this could be a big and this could be an absolute whacker um, eventually I did see it It came up and it was a uh, another good common it wasn't the the monster that I was chasing but at, at the time I can remember just being extremely happy with bracing a couple of really really nice fish got that one got, got that one up onto the bank again went through the the same process um, and as you can see from the the footage here these these commons are they're built for fighting they are are river river rockets they just go off like trains uh, and they cause you all sorts of oh. a couple of little marks on the side a couple of scales that it's maybe lost in the past definitely be a recognizable one but I doubt the chances of ever seeing it again in a river like the Hawkesbury that's hundreds of kilometres long, probably close to impossible. Um, but yeah, happy days, uh, great start to the day. Um, hopefully uh, it's big mum comes along sometime soon. But nah, lovely fish, good fight. The rod tip, I couldn't get it off the bottom, so I started to think, hey, this could be an all right fish, and it turns out it was. But nah, great start to the day. Let's have a look at the other side side cannot be grumbling with that clean let's keep going hopefully more to come fingers crossed we'll get it back it's quite hot already managed another common and i thought got to get this one up for uh, a bit of film it's a really nice river fish and wait till you see it it's uh, built for fighting go another cracking common took me up and down the margin under the rod tip this this uh baiting cam campaign couldn't be going any better absolutely stoked with that get the other side there we go other side absolutely mega as the sun starts to come out put that bloody glare on the on the fish but Oh, oh, look at that. Bit of light change there. Happy days, man. Keep them coming. Keep them bloody coming. So, yeah, it, it was awesome to, to get amongst a few better fish. Obviously, I was extremely happy catching that brace. Um, that sort of put an end to, to that short spell of fishing. Again, I was going back through the process of being back in the office, back in the back in the office, um, nine till five, all I could think about was the, the fish and what I'd been catching over the, the, previous, the previous couple of weeks. Um, still going through that same process of coming down, putting in 25 kilo. Um, in some instances, I, I realized I was getting a little bit out of hand with cooking bait. Um, so some nights I was putting in 10 kilo, but most nights I was still trying to put in 20, 25, 30 kilo of pigeon conditioner. Um, now, the following week came and this is where 
I look I look back on this particular session as a little bit of bittersweet and you guys will, will sort of find out why. Now, at this point of the session or, or the campaign, you could say, I never I never had um I never had the intention of making a video, a, a vlog. There was never a plan to put anything like this together. Um I never expected to catch some good, really, really good fish. Um the vlog was definitely at the back of my mind. It was never something that I thought I was going to be doing. Now, what happened next? I came down that weekend, um, Saturday morning, rods are out, same process again. I'm stuck into some, some fish relatively quickly. Um, the first fish being a ghosty of about 23, 24 pound. Um, the second fish was, I think it was a small fish and then this is where the sort of bittersweet moment happens. Now, right hander, off like, off like clockwork, screaming off across the, the river. It's probably about eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning at this point. And this fish is off like the clappers across the river. Um, the difference between this fish and the other fish is that this one wasn't absolutely towing across the river. This was more so a slowly but surely making its way across the current um, and again I could tell I was into a better fish now over the next five ten minutes it was plodding up and down up and down up and down in the current not making any really really long surging runs but just really slow powerful runs where you couldn't do much um, and that was probably the first time that I thought this is this is a good one this is a really special one the the thought of a 40 pounder was never in my mind but i i just knew that it was going to be a, a lot more special than perhaps the fish that i'd caught previously um and eventually over the course of a few minutes this fish is under the rod tip i've got it up on the surface and i can see clearly that it's it's the biggest fish i've caught but by a long way from from australia um without a doubt the biggest carp i've caught yet from australia I bundle it into the net. Um, I ring my mate Liam, who's in work at the time, and I said, Liam, I've got this fish. Is there any way in which you can come down? Um, and obviously he's in work. He's pretty new to Australia, so he didn't want to risk it. He couldn't come down. And obviously if he tried to, he'd probably get a, a bit of a clip round the ear from his boss. So obviously there's nothing he could do. Um, I've got this fish in the net and I thought, look, I'm going to have to ring my mate who come down the week previous uh, and say, C can you get down? Is there any way you can come down again? O obviously, he's not as he he's not a keen angler. So sort of dragging him down all the time to, to weigh fish, I felt a little bit bad. But I just knew that this fish was was something special. Um, anyway, we, we got it weighed up. It ended up being about 35. It ended up being anything between 35 and 36 pound um, the reason that i say anything between 35 and 36 pound is because the scales that we use to weigh the fish are more like sea fishing scales so it doesn't really have the the ounces it's more so going up in pounds or kilos so this fish was anything between 35 and 36 pound the reason that i can say that it's extremely bittersweet is because as I said, I knew that I never at that point in time thought that I was going to do a vlog and all of the footage and all of the photos that we've got of this particular fish, the background exposes the entire swim, the entire stretch. Um, and, and for obvious reasons, I don't want to risk publicizing my, my spot, but even more importantly, I don't really want to get a lot of attention from Australian anglers and things like that coming down to this particular area. So bittersweet, great to catch a carp around my first upper 30 from Australia. Um, but the bittersweet side of it is I can't show you guys. And looking back now, I kick myself. I think, Walker, why weren't you thinking at the time? You should have known all this, but I guess I've got the photos and, and that's something, that's the most important thing at the end of the day bloody boat coming past now so we'll uh we'll just cut it for a second blooming out we've got crows we've got boats we've got jet skis we've got everything going on here so yeah we'll have to crack on um but yeah obviously buzzing to have, have caught that fish bittersweet not being able to show you guys but still i've still got the memories still got the photos so still extremely happy to have, have put two two really really good fish on the bank 
Um, you can see me twitching looking around there and, and the reason I'm doing that is because of the snakes. That they're, they're probably gonna, gonna be out and about today, especially with this hot weather. It's 33 degrees today. So if you see me twitching or looking left and right all the time, it's not because I'm I'm scared to look directly into the camera. Um, it's because I've got to I've got to stay alive. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, obviously happy to have caught that fish. That sort of put an end to, to that session. Again, knew fully well that I was going into a week where um, I was going to be working. I was going to have to come down, keep going through that process of putting in the bait. Um, I knew that there was probably three to four, maybe three weeks left if I was lucky um, before the fish spawned. So I knew that time was ticking. I knew that I still had my heart set on catching an Australian giant. I didn't want to wait another year for another winter spell to try and get back amongst them. And obviously catching a few better sized fish, I knew that I was in with an outside chance of catching one. Um, so yeah, again, full steam ahead for another week, coming down, putting in bait every single night, knowing fully well that I had this week booked off. Now, this week had been booked off for ages because of the full moon. I think it was a super moon or, or something it was called from my, my Tide app. But I knew that the weather was looking good. Um, it was going to be relatively colder than what it had been over the previous weeks, um, which was obviously a positive. Uh, but I knew that this full moon spell was coming. I knew that I had a week off work. That meant that I could go all, all out, pile the bait in. Um, was I at that point in time knowing that I was going to do a full week's fishing? I thought I'll probably come down and do the morning sessions, the bite times, fish a few evenings. Um, but sort of one thing le led to another and I ended up pretty much living down here. Um, so yeah, obviously pumped for, pumped for the week off, kept the bait going in. Um, Saturday soon came around um, and, and again followed the same process. Rod's back out on the spot. Um, relatively quiet to begin with. I think over the first two or three days, I probably only caught a handful of fish. Um, no good ones, just similar sort of fish. Mid doubles, scraper 20s, um, still getting amongst some good fish. Um, I knew that the full moon was coming on the Tuesday. I think it was the Tuesday that the full moon was coming. Um, so as everyone always says, big commons, full moon. I was thinking, yes, th this is gonna be the one. Um, and if you can remember from previously in the video there, the, the big wood carvings that I caught out of the, the previous venue, they actually came bang on the full moon. Um, me and my friend Charlie, we, 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 we sort of fished uh, a couple of nights around the full moon and I was lucky enough to catch two of the, the really special ones out of that previous venue. So of, of course, you're naturally getting a bit more hyped up. What I also knew is that given the fact that it was a full moon, we were going to see a, a change to the tide. So with the full moon, that naturally affects the ocean naturally affects tides. I knew that we were going to be in with a bit of a change to the river condition around the Tuesday, Wednesday as well. So given the fact that I'd caught a lot of fish on the tides that were sort of pumping through a lot more water movement, I thought this could be game on. So yeah, first two or three days I was still catching quite consistently, a couple of fish each day. Um, and then I sort of came into the, the full moon day. Um, now on the, the day of the full moon, it's, it was so, so strange. I can remember being absolutely full of confidence. The rod's going out perfectly. I, I'm sat back, back in my bivvy thinking, this is gonna happen. Um, and I actually blanked. I never had a single fish across probably a 24 to 36 hour period in what you would imagine is probably the best time to go fishing. Full moon, great tide, great conditions. The, the swim's been baited heavily and I didn't catch a single fish. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, the, the following morning, the rods went out um, and uh, I had my first bite at probably about eight o'clock. I, I caught my first fish. Um, that, that, tell a lie, I didn't actually fish that night. I fished the night of the full moon. I didn't catch on the, the the night of the full moon or that bite spell. So I thought, sod it, I'm gonna go home. I was a bit disappointed. I went home, got a shower, got some food, etc., um, and decided not to fish that night. Um, I can remember lying in bed that night thinking, 
why, why are you not down there? Why on earth are you sat at home? You've got a week off, you've been baiting your swim. Yeah, you've not caught um, for, for 36 hours, but what the hell are you doing sat at home, scrolling up and down Instagram and watching other people catch on YouTube? So I thought, I need, I need to get back down there. So that night, again, went through the process, got a load of bait cooked up, refreshed everything, shower, food, all that type of stuff. Um, set my alarm for four o'clock in the morning. Um, and you'd be thinking I'd be up all night excited to get back down. Well, I'd be telling a lie because I slept through my alarm um, and I woke up at about 6.30 and I can remember being so like guilty. I thought, what on earth are you doing? You've put in all of this effort. Um, you've caught all of these you know, nice fish. You're trying to catch a really, really big fish from the, the river uh, and you're sleeping in through an alarm when you shouldn't be. So anyway, I got pulled myself up out of bed, made the trip down there, um, got pulled up and thought, look, I'm probably going to miss the, the bite time now because um, it was probably about 7, 7.30 by the time I got down there. Um, so I thought I'll get myself a Mackey's breakfast on the way, um, being the fat sod that I am. Got the Mackey's breakfast, got down to the swim, flicked the rods out. Now, given the fact that I hadn't caught on the last trip, I was extremely surprised to receive a take within about 10, 15 minutes of being there. Um, again, this, this, this fish is surging off down the current. I can tell straight away it's not a, not a small fish. Um, it's going downstream with the current on this occasion. Um, again, big surging, very wary of the, the snags down the right hand margin. I can feel it grating up and down the snags while this fish is probably 50, 60 yards downstream from it. Um, luckily, I've got, I think it's 30, 35 pound braid on, so I wasn't too concerned, but I was more concerned about putting on too much pressure so that I was bringing the fish into the snag. So what I did, the fish was 50 yards past the snag. I just took on a curve and held it without reeling, thinking that the fish is soon going to hit the margin and then kite back out into the open water. Um, and luckily it did. Th this fish sort of swung round right out in front of me. Again, cranking it up and down. It's, it's plodding up and down the margin. And again, I've got this, I've got this fish into the net. Um, now, again, this, this, this was a fish that I knew was pretty good. I knew that it was probably around the 30 pound mark. Um, but given the fact that it was 7, 7.30 in the morning, I didn't really want to call my mate and get him down here. So I did a, a few videos and a, a few self takes um, and sort of put it on its way. But no, cra cracking fish and, and again, very, very surprised to have, have caught one so so quick back into the trip after taking that, that sort of break out of it. Here we go, guys. Not long finished me Mackie's breakfast. First rod's gone. <laughs> Another absolute breeze block of a common. I don't think I need to say anything more. These these river carp are just doing all the talking. But mega, mega fish. There we go. <laughs> Another absolute tank. Peas in a pod. Mwah! Fucking chuff, man. <sighs> I'm absolutely dreading summer now. I wish winter could just go on forever. What a fish. What an absolute beast. Oh, let's get her back. So yeah, excellent fish and, and I still had a few days left of my uh, my week off to go. Um, again, I knew that time was ticking. The days were getting a little bit warmer. Um, the days were becoming far more uncomfortable sat down here. Long, sweaty, sweaty days. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't nice, I'll be very, very honest. Um, one of my friends that I'd been sort of keeping in touch with um, was a, a lad who's originally from England. He, he's been he's been in Australia for a lot longer than I have. Um, he, he won't mind me saying this, but he's got a proper Aussie bogan accent now. Uh, sorry, Jimmy, um, but he, he's a lad that I'd done quite a bit of sea fishing with um, over the past year or so. Um, he, he fishes for for all sorts of different fish in the in the ocean. Um, and he'd been kind enough to take me up to a few of his sort of secret spots uh, and put me on to some special, special fish. Um, he hadn't really fished for carp for many, many years in Australia. He lives probably th two and a half, three hours outside of Sydney. I'd been keeping in touch with him, telling him about some of the fish that I'd been catching. Um, and, and I knew that obviously he'd, he'd fished for carp previously back home. 
Um, he'd never had the bug to fish for carp in Australia. And obviously I'm on the phone to him, ringing him, telling him about these fish I've been catching him, FaceTiming him with these fish hold up. Uh, and he's, he, he, I can hear it in his voice. He's like, crikey, I need, I need a bit of this. I, I want a bit of this. Um, and to be honest, Jimmy's a very, very good mate of mine. So I said to him, look, get down here, come down for a couple of days fishing. Um, obviously lent him a little bit of an end tackle. He, he still had a bit of kit that had, had cut the job when it comes to carp fishing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, he made the, the two, two and a half, three hour trip down um, to, to stay on my sofa and do a couple of night, couple of days fishing. Um, and I can remember him turning up and just saying, Walker, please, can I just catch a 20 pounder? I just want a 20 pounder. And I said to him, I said, mate, you, you'll get a 20 pounder for sure. So I put him in just next door to me. Um, we sat back that night, had a takeaway, bit of a catch up. Um, he got down on the, I think it was the Wednesday evening or the Thursday evening. He come down, we drove straight down to the river, put a load of bait in, go back, have a takeaway with the, the plan of getting down first thing in the morning. Um, and as I mentioned, all he wanted was a 20 pounder. Um, so we got down that morning, flicked out the rods, Naturally, I wanted my main baited spot, so I went in on my spot and he tucked in a little bit downstream where we'd put in the, the bait the night before. Um, and within probably half an hour, we sat, in, we sat in my swim and one of his rods has gone into absolute meltdown. It's peeling off down the river. And, and the funny story is Jimmy's, Jimmy's basically Australian now. He's got the Australian accent. You'd think that he'd be comfortable with snakes and all these different things going on but no jimmy jimmy's not not um not good with snakes so i'd been sending him all these pictures and videos of snakes and naturally his rod's peeling off down the river and he's like tiptoeing back to his rod he's like slowly but surely going back to his rod so hit it hit it and he's hooked this fish it's gone off down the current and I could see it come up to the surface. It, it, it was going along the surface, this big orange, orange golden -y thing. I said, mate, you, you've, got a, you've got one of the good koi's, a, a really nice fish. Um, and, and obviously he was stoked to just be into a carp after sort of being out the game for, for so, so long. Um, bundled this fish into the net and, oh, it was a cracker. It was a, a cracking, I think it was a 20, about 23, 24 pound um, orange koi, pristine fish. Um, and he was stoked just to have been into a carp. So he, he, he was thanking me. He was very appreciative. I was like, mate, you, you've done me favours in the past. You've put me on fish. So I, I was probably more happy than he was for him to have caught. Little did he realise that he's, uh, he was going to catch something a little bit bigger. Um, old golden balls. Other rod went off not too, uh, not too long after. Clearly a much better fish. The, the one previously, 23, 24 pounder. This one was going off just like the, the fish that I, I'd caught previously. I said, Jimmy, you, you're into a pretty good fish here. Um, up and down the current, he's fishing quite heavy, heavy rods, heavy equipment, but you could still see that this fish was quite special. It was taking him up and down the margin. I've got the snags to the right of my swim and he's fishing over the other side. So this fish is kiting round, it's trying to take him into the snags. He, he's giving it all that he can. Um, and luckily he got this one into the net. Um, we, we got that one up. Um, Jimmy actually brought some scales down with him so we didn't have to go through that, that whole kerfuffle of ringing anybody to come down. Um, and, and yeah, we put that one on the scales. It was £31. Pound. Um, to see his face and just to see uh, what is a very, very good mate of mine catch two fish in, in relatively quick, quick succession um, and then both to be incredible looking fish. I was absolutely over the moon. It was just one of those moments where you look back with a, a good mate um, and you see them catch something pretty special, um, an awesome, awesome moment to see him catch those fish. So yeah, obviously very, very happy for, for Jimmy to get amongst a couple of fish on his trip down. Um, I, I came down later that day after he'd gone, put in about 25 kilo of bait again, um, with the vision of coming down the following morning. Um, I wasn't as motivated because by that point, it had been a few days since I'd had a, a bit of consistent fishing. I'd caught one or two over the past few days. Obviously, the fact that Jimmy had just caught those really, really nice fish was enough to keep me sort of going. And I knew that the time was ticking. 
um, the temperature was starting to soar. We were getting 25, 26, 27 degree days, bearing in mind that we we're about the first day of spring. Um, so really, really uncomfortable fishing, uh, but I knew that spawning probably wasn't too far around the corner. Um, so I had to make the most of it. Um, got down that day, put the rods back out, scorching hot, hot heat by about 7.30, 8.30 in the morning. And I can remember being sat back thinking, what's going on? You know, I've caught one or two fish in the past few days. Um, I've still been as consistent and ever, ever with the bait. Um, nothing's changed and, and, and nothing much is happening. Um, just gone past a full moon, prime conditions, and it's gone really, really slow. Um, but yeah, it, it got to about probably 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, the, the sun's well and truly in the sky by now. What I would classify as the worst fishing conditions that I've, I've seen since I've been fishing the, the spot up until then. Um, what, what sort of happened next come completely out of the blue. Um, and just looking back now, it's been a, a few weeks since this has happened and what happened next um, could only something that I, I could dream of. Um, I can remember thinking, it's getting hot, I'm going to pack up. It got to about 11 o'clock, I'm going to pack up, go home and come back and just fish the nights because the days were too uncomfortable. Anyway... I can remember getting it. I did get a take off a sea fish, like a, a bream. It's a sea fish over here. And I thought, for God's sake, nothing's happening. I'm catching a bloody sea fish. Um, I'm just going to come back when it gets dark. So caught this sea fish, unhooked it, threw it back, tied up a new rig, underarmed it back out, sat back, middle rod, churner, meltdown. 11 o'clock, scorching heat, worst conditions, churner going across the middle. I've hooked into this fish and without any shadow of a doubt, the longest run I've ever had, had off a carp in the whole time I've been carp fishing. I picked up the rod and this the rods took on a full curve and it's just gone into one run zzz, straight through the straight across the middle of the river, all the way across to the far bank. Before it's ran out of space to move, it's hit the far bank and then it's just took on a kite up the left hand margin and um, with the current so i've hooked this fish and it's done this full run all the way across to the far bank i can see by the line cutting through the water that it must be almost on the far margin and then all of a sudden it's took on a left swing through with the current so it's it's gone from being a zzz screaming to a zzz along the far margin i'm still bent double into this fish and I, I can remember, I've got my GoPro on, on my head, I'm playing this fish and I can remember just thinking, this is a serious fish, this, this is a serious, serious fish. Uh, at this point, it still never crossed my mind as to what it could possibly be at that point in time. Um, but yeah, it's it's churning up the far margin, it's done the, the, the standard run to the far bank and then it's doing the same thing along the far margin. This fish isn't stopping though. The other fish, I could stop at the probably 70, 80, 90 yard mark. This fish carried on. This fish was going all the way down the current to the point where I was, I was concerned about what was gonna happen next. Um, eventually, I've managed to put the brakes on it at the point where it's got probably 100, 110 yards down the river. Um, now, my concern was I only knew what was down the left-hand margin for the, for the sort of 50, 60, 70 yards. I didn't know what was further down there, and this is where that fish had got. So at this point in time, I was really panicking. I'd got into the water up to my, probably not far from my waist. Um, I've got the rod tip right under the water, and I'm, again, I'm cringing. I know that I've got braid all the way through, and I know that there's a chance that I could pull the hook. Um, one thing to note at this point in time as well is that I, I am a big fan of using very, very big hooks. And the, the last big hook that I had at that point in time um, was these, these, I was using size four or two corder cranks. Um, and that, that sea fish was the last fish that I'd caught on those hooks and I was out. So when I put the bloody rustling in the bushes, when I put the, when I put the bloody rustling in the bushes. So yeah, when I put the rig back out, I had to go with, I think it was a size six wide gape. That doesn't sound small, but when you're so used to using size twos, 
it, it puts a bit of doubt in your mind and I was, I, I'll be honest, I was panicking. But yeah, anyway, this fish is going down the left-hand margin. I'm bent double into it. I, I'm panicking. Um, I'm losing my mind. I, I know that I'm into a very big fish. I know that I've not got long left and I need to make this one count. So I'm in the water up to my waist, cringing as this fish is going up and down the left-hand margin before I can see I've got it into the sort of safer territory. Um, got it down the left-hand side. It's kiting off out into the middle. And again, it's gone on another surge straight across to the far margin. So at this point, I, I'm, I'm shaking. I, I'm knowing that I could be into the, the fish that I'm chasing. It's gone across to the far margin. And then we've got a slow plod all the way back to my margin. So really, really slow, similar to the 30-odd the, the pounder that I caught um, a few, a, a few uh, days or so earlier. Um, this fish is now under the rod tip, up and down the margin, really, really slowly. It's took on another run, maybe 10, 15 yards out, and then swung back round. I'm pulling upwards, and then this fish's mouth just comes up like this, swimming towards me. And I could see from the, the back of the fish that this was completely different to anything else I've caught so far. I, I could see, at this point in time, I knew I was hooked into the fish of my dreams, a, a giant Australian common, something that I've fished for for years. And I could see now that without any shadow of a doubt, in front of me, I was hooked into one. So this fish is swimming towards me. It's took a lunge and almost swam essentially straight into where I'm stood. And then it swung back out, a few plods up and down the rod tip, I'm still going into meltdown. I'm panicking about this small hook. I'm panicking if there's braid damage. Everything's going through my mind. I've bundled this fish into the net and I've just took the biggest breath of air ever. I can breathe now. I've got it in the net. Um, I look down at it in the net and, and I'm still speechless now. What, what was sat down in front of me just completely blew my mind. I, I knew that it was without a doubt, not just the biggest carp I caught in Australia, but I knew it was the biggest common I've ever caught in my life. Um, it's been, it had been many, many years since I'd looked at a carp of that size. And to see, to be in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Australia, seeing that thing sat in my net, looking up at me with this little tiny size six hook, I didn't know what to say. I, I, I was just completely in awe of what I was looking at. Um, so yeah, made the phone, made a couple of phone calls, let a couple of my mates, I just had to tell someone. I, I rang a couple of mates and um, told them that I'm pretty confident I've got a 40 pounder in the net. Um, the, the panic set in knowing that I've not got scales again. I was like, here we go again. What am I going to do next? Um, so I sacked it up in the margin, rang a couple of mates told them what I think I've got. Um, got what I thought at that point in time, I knew it was gonna be a while until I could get a mate to come down and do um, some photos, all that type of stuff, weighing the fish, etc. So the first thing that I did was get it up onto the bank. Um, and I, I went through the process of doing a bit of video footage. Um, and as you can see from this guys, it's, <laughs> You can tell by my reaction, I, I'm a spluttering mess. I don't know what to say. Um, so yeah, it, here we go, guys. This is the, the fish that has been the penultimate of my fishing in Australia so far. Um, and it's probably gonna be a very, very long time until I catch something like this again. Here we go, guys. It's happened. It's fucking happened. Oh, oh my God. What a fish. Absolutely fat as a pig. Absolute breeze block. I cannot believe it. What an absolute tank that is. Oh my days. Oh my. Winter complete, man. <laughs> Can't even speak. <laughs> Absolutely blown away with that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Fuck. So yeah, as you can see, I became a, a complete mess in front of the camera when I caught that fish. Um, absolutely blown away, completely mind-blowing, being able to see a fish like that on my looking mat 
um, after fishing for so long. Um, I, I can remember getting on that plane, coming to Sydney, um, going through the process of going through Google Maps, all these different venues, all these different kilometres travelled, uh, and only seeing a handful of, of fish over the 40 pound barrier from Australia ever. I never in my wildest dreams thought that I'd finally be holding one. Um, so yeah, completely and utterly privileged to have caught a fish, fish like that. Um, I, I can remember sitting back on the bank, um, waiting for my friend to come down to, to do all of the weighing and things like that. Um, and, and yeah, um, the rods are everywhere. The rods did, definitely didn't go back out. I, I knew that was coming to a close anyway. Um, the rods didn't go back out, as bad as that sounds. Um, I can remember getting that, that fish, putting it all back, um, and then I went straight home to, to me missus, straight out to the pub, um, uh, a roast dinner, a few beers to celebrate, um, and that was that. I just knew that you, you're supposed to ride the wave and carry on, on when you're lucky, but when, when I put things into perspective, how much effort I'd put in, um, as well as the amount of years, all that searching on Google Maps, all of those kilometres travelled, all of that effort put into catching a fish like that, I wasn't bothered. I was like, I need to celebrate this fish. I need to relax now. My missus is hating me because I've spent so much time away from her. Um, I've spent so much money putting bait in on all these toll, on, on all this pigeon mix, going through all these toll roads, driving down after work every single night. I, I was pretty fished out by this point. Um, and there was no better way to, to wrap up than catching a, a 40 plus common from the river. Um, so yeah, I, I, I still now, looking back on it, and I'm, I imagine it's, it's going to take a long time to settle in. Um, but yeah, to, to be now part of a, a very, very small, lucky club of people in Australia to have had a fish like that. Um, counting myself lucky is a, is a big understatement. It's a massive understatement. Um, but yeah, what my plan is now, um, now that in hindsight, now that I know that the fish have spawned, that's probably going to put an end to, to me fishing on this river for a good few months. Um, over the next few trips, what you'll probably find me doing is going to some of the more vast open waters, big, big rivers. Um, you might catch me on some of the reservoirs, some of the huge lakes across the ACT and the snowy mountains. Um, what I would love to do moving forward is give you guys more of an opportunity to see where I'm fishing because unfortunately on this place I just can't really show much in terms of backgrounds and things like that um, but there are a lot of footage going to be coming over the next few vlogs of places that really give you guys a really good insight into what is on offer in Australia and um, the scenery um, the wildlife, all of these different things are going to be coming over the spring, summer and autumn before I get back and, and hit the campaign hard. Um, so yeah, ho hopefully that gives you guys a, a bit of an, a, a small insight to, to fishing in Australia from an initial point of view, um, where it sort of began, how the, the sort of fishing transpired, and then a bit of a, a snippet into my recent fishing. Um, I, I apologise in advance for my lack of vlogging and editing and videoing skills. I'm going to get better. Um, so I'm bracing myself for the keyboard warriors. So bring them on. You guys can give me all of the feedback you want. I, I want to get better and I want to give something um, good for you guys to watch on, on YouTube. Um, and I do feel a little bit of pressure because Australia is obviously very unique. There's next to nothing on YouTube in terms of carp fishing in Australia. So I do feel a little bit of pressure in terms of trying to do it justice. So yeah, apologies for my editing, apologies for, for my, uh, my terrible uh, videoing skills. Um, and apologies for my uh, spluttering, spluttering commentary whilst holding that fish. But I'm sure I, I'm going to get better and hopefully it's due to catching more of those really, really good comments. Um, so yeah, ho hope you guys enjoyed the first one. The next one's going to be on a, a, a dam in the Snowy Mountains. You'll catch me on a, a reservoir that's about 11,000 acres. Bit different to the river. Th this place is full of carp. So I imagine you guys are going to see a lot of nice scenery, a lot of footage um, and fingers crossed a lot of carp. So I hope you enjoy the first one and fingers crossed this is going to be the first of many. Cheers.